Okay, this is your lab prep for uh, posterior triangle and neck lab. Um, this is really more like superficial neck, I guess, because um, we will be sort of overlapping between posterior and anterior triangles. But in any case, um, we're going to start um, in the neck region. Um, so we're, you'll want to um, loosen the head bags. You can cut through the string. Um, that's tied around the bag and relax the bag and you can pull it up to um, the line of the mandible. We don't want to expose the face yet, that's not necessary. Um, but we do need full access to the neck, um, both anterior, lateral, and posterior. So um, get the bag to sort of come up to about here and then we'll be good to go. Um, so we're going to start by removing the skin from the whole anterior and lateral neck. Um, posterior should have already been done. and I would suggest the um, best way to do that would be to start with a midline cut and um, reflect from the midline and go out laterally. Uh, there's not much in the midline that you could damage, so that's a great place to start. Um, this is very skin, very thin skin removal, um, different than all the other skin removal you've done so far. Um, so, what if you're concerned at all? Um, I would suggest you know leave all of the fat down and just remove. Um, the epidermis and the dermis um, layer and leave all of the fat down on the tissue um, and we'll be able to work through that. There's usually not that much fat in the neck so um, this uh, or at least in the superficial neck so um, this is a proceed with caution step. Okay so um, once you get the fat um, and or with the skin removed um, we may have to do a little bit of cleanup in terms of fat removal but um, the first structure we're going to be looking for is a very thin muscle called the platysma. Um, it's nowhere near this big, uh, and or this robust or obvious. Um, it has this orientation, um, you know, flaring off to the side from the angle of the mandible. But it is, uh, it's definitely not this robust. Um, I've done this a lot of times and I've never seen it look that good. Um, but platysma, um, it's so named because it's flat. and it is a muscle of facial expression um, that we'll learn more about later in the course. Um, once this is identified, um, we need to reflect this superiorly. Probably the easiest place to start is not from the bottom and work your way up, but to rather work from this edge, because this edge is going to be the most easy thing to see. Um, and if you can get a scissor underneath there and start pushing tissues apart, you'll be able to get this to reflect as a sheet. Um, once you get the platysma out of the way, um, then we'll actually be able to observe the posterior triangle um, anatomically. These are its three borders, trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, and clavicle. Um, so get those uh, structures identified right away. We need those landmarks to be clear. Uh, and then we want to take a look at um, some of the structures that are lying on the surface of the sternocleidomastoid. And this is a good reason to exercise caution when you're reflecting the platysma, because especially this vein, the external jugular, has a tendency to want to stick to the back of the platysma when you reflect it. So um, go easy um, when you're reflecting platysma and keep an eye open for a vein that might be um, sandwiched between it and the sternocleidomastoid. Um, so in addition to the external jugular vein, which will be seen on the lateral or superficial surface of SCM, um, the internal jugular vein will be seen, and it's quite large by comparison. Um, and it will be deep to the sternocleidomastoid. You may be able to see that already today without getting anywhere into the fascia of this um, carotid triangle here. Um, so observe your veins. Um, if you've got an external jugular vein, that's great. Um, if you follow it up superiorly, eventually this turns into the retromandibular vein. Um, so have a look and see if that happens in yours. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is um, look for the specific branches of the cervical plexus um, that we're going to do today. Most of what we're going to do today are, are sensory branches of the cervical plexus um, and three of them have particular relationships to the sternocleidomastoid. Um, these three nerves here, lesser occipital nerve, greater, um, great auricular nerve, and the transverse cervical nerve all come from the cervical plexus and they are sensory branches that are um, responsible for innervating the skin. And they all emerge from about the same spot, right behind sternocleidomastoid. This is called the nerve point of the neck. And these three so sensory branches, as well as there's another one down here that we'll get to in a second, um, all emerge from this place and they're responsible for sensation over the whole anterior and posterior triangle regions. Um, so pretty important. 
Um, in addition, the great auricular um, comes up onto the face um, to supply the ear and a little bit of, around the angle of the mandible. Um, so this isn't the last time we're going to see these nerves in our exploration of the head and neck. Um, but have a look, they're usually pretty thin. Um, great auricular is probably the biggest. It's usually parallel with the external jugular vein and often quite close, closer than is represented here. You'll see those two um, near each other. Um, so have a look for these. Um, these two will be easier than this one. You'll have to almost get behind and underneath the sternocleidomastoid in order to get to lesser occipital. Alright, um, the last branch of the cervical plexus we'll see today is the um, supraclavicular nerve. Um, there's usually several of these um, that are running, instead of this direction, across the sternocleidomastoid, they're, they're coming from the same place, but they're running down out towards the clavicle. And these should, if you, this space is usually filled with fat in here, and if you work through this fat, you'll be able to find these nerves relatively simply. Um, the last nerve we're going to find today is not a branch of the cervical plexus at all. You've seen this before. This is the spinal accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11. Um, we found it before on the deep surface of trapezius, so we're kind of just working our way backwards, and now we're finding it um, before, right before it got to the trapezius. And you'll usually find this one in this sort of orientation, coming from deep to the sternocleidomastoid and progressing downward deep to the trapezius. This nerve innervates both of those two muscles, so this is a good visual reminder of that. Okay, so that's, that's about all we're going to do with the posterior triangle today. Um, then I'll have you turn to the anterior triangle, and we're going to do some real basic um, laryngeal skeleton and muscular anatomy associated with the larynx. Um, so we've got um, the hyoid bone. It won't be this easily visible, but you'll definitely be able to feel it. Um, you can palpate your own um, if you need any sort of comparison. The thyroid cartilage, which should be pretty easy to see, um, it has the laryngeal prominence or Adam's apple. Um, the cricoid cartilage, which is just below that, and then a soft membrane in between the two. So if you use your fingers and sort of palpate these cartilaginous landmarks um, and then the hyoid bone, feel for the soft spot between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, and that'll be your cricothyroid membrane. Um, once you have these landmarks identified, the muscles are a snap. Um, the first two muscles that we'll identify come off of the hyoid bone, so they have hyoid in the name, um, omohyoid and sternohyoid. Sternohyoid, as its name suggests, goes straight down to attach to the sternum, um, and it's paired right in the midline. Um, omohyoid is a little different. The word omo means shoulder. Um, so this muscle actually goes underneath the sternocleidomastoid, and that's as far as we're going to see it today. But just for your information, um, omohyoid continues on, and it actually has an inferior belly, which progresses down deep into the posterior triangle, and actually attaches on the scapula right near that suprascapular notch um, that we saw earlier from the backside. Um, so omohyoid is kind of an odd muscle. Both of these muscles will be helpful to depress the hyoid, which I think is clear to look at them. <clears throat> you'll, you'll probably want to either reflect or move those two muscles out of the way in order to see the deeper muscles. There's one called thyrohyoid, which goes from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone. That name is evident. And one from the, the thyroid cartilage down to the sternum, which is called sternothyroid. Um, so. Um, the, the other muscle that's in this area is sort of functionally a different story completely from all of these, um, but we're going to identify it since we're here. This muscle is called cricothyroid. It goes from the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage. It's really small. It just looks like a little fan that's connecting the two. Um, so these muscles are all thyro, hyo, sterno, omo, crico, something. Um, it can be a little bit of a, a challenge verbally to get these words straight. So. Take, you take your time going through these slowly um, and get to the point where you feel like it's pretty easy. Um, but the key to doing that is really making sure you can identify these um, laryngeal landmarks. All right, that's it. This is going to be kind of a short lab, I think. So good luck. <laughs>